This is John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and we're here with our review of the Mod X chassis from AB Arms. Uh, we talked to AB Arms a while back. They asked us if we would be interested in reviewing their chassis system, and of course we said yes. Uh, so they sent us out the chassis. Uh, it came in a really nice box. It came with the Luthar stock here and the AB Arms P-Grip. And so we grabbed our uh, AAC SD, uh, we pulled it out of the KDX Strike 30 chassis that it was sitting in, and we dropped it in to the Mod X chassis. Now one of the things that really excited me about the Mod X chassis is first of all, it comes in at $800 price point, and for that $800 price point, uh, it offers you a lot of advantages that you only see on higher price chassis. Uh, one is this nice monolithic style, uh, one piece upper rail that gives you 20 MOA cant from the back to the front. Uh, you also get this nice tubular style handguard that has key mod interfaces at 3, 6, and 9 o'clock. Uh, so you have a lot of modularity in the system. Uh, you also have an AR style stock on it and AR pistol grip. So again, you can tailor the chassis uh, to what you want out of it. Uh, what kind of stocks you want, what kind of grips you want. Uh, when we went to install our AACSD into the chassis, we did come into a couple of little issues. Uh, the first issue that we really noticed was when we went to drop it in, the trigger would not fit down into the inlet. Uh, and that reason was because we had a Mod 22 trigger from Extreme Shooting Products in it. Uh, the Mod 22 trigger is an awesome trigger. It is a two-stage trigger. Uh, it is really a beast of a trigger. It's got a really large housing on it, uh, but it fit just fine in quite a few other chassis systems that we've dropped it into. Uh, it would not fit in the Mod X chassis. Uh, so we thought, no big deal, since the housing on the trigger is quite large, it's probably just something they didn't account for in the inlet. Uh, so we grabbed a Timney 517 trigger off the bench, and we threw the Timney 517 trigger on the action and tried to drop it in. Uh, that was also a no-go. That inlet was just too tight. Uh, we then tried the old uh, standard, the Remington pre-2006 trigger, the old Walker trigger. Uh, we put that on. We figured it's a Remington factory trigger. It should fit into a chassis that's designed for a Remington 700. Uh, that trigger was also a no-go. Uh, so we punched it off, we grabbed an X-Mark trigger, we dropped an X-Mark on, and the action dropped right into the inlet. So it appears that the inlet is really only cut for the X-Mark trigger and really does not want to accept any of the other triggers out there to include the pre-2006 uh, Remington trigger and some of the most popular triggers out there, the Timney triggers. Uh, the other thing that we noticed when we were installing the action is the recoil lug inlet uh, is very small. Uh, it has just enough clearance to give you the appropriate uh, area around the factory lug. Uh, if you have a aftermarket barrel installed and while your smith was truing your rifle, if you put an aftermarket lug on, uh, it probably will not fit in the chassis without the smith going back in and opening that recoil lug recess up. Uh, so it's something you want to keep in mind. A factory action will drop in just fine, a factory lug that is. Uh, but for instance, uh, when Southern Indiana Precision did our last 700, uh, they put a PTG oversized lug on it and there's no way that PTG lug would fit in this action. Uh, PTG lugs are massive meaty lugs to begin with. Uh, there are a lot of chassis out there that those won't fit, uh, but this really is only sized for a Remington lug. Uh, anything larger than a Remington lug and you're gonna have binding issues. And binding issues will not give you the best accuracy out of the chassis system and out of the action once it's bolted in. So once we got the action actually bolted in to the chassis section, uh, we noticed that the rear action mounting screw, if you notice it goes right through here and it ends up being covered by the pistol grip. Uh, so if you're one of those guys that habitually checks your action or action screw torque, you're not gonna be able to do it without removing the pistol grip each time. Uh, so that's mildly annoying. The, the front action screw you can access, uh, the rear action screw you cannot. Uh, 
Uh, also, just know that you have to remove the tubular forend because the one-piece rail is attached to the tubular forend. Uh, so if you want to pull the action, you basically have to remove or disassemble the entire chassis system. Uh, that's not a deal breaker because a lot of chassis systems out there that have a tubular style forend and a one-piece top rail or a monolithic style top rail uh, will require considerable disassembly to totally remove the action. But I really do like to see at least exposed action screws so you can check your torque or you can put witness marks on them and verify uh, that those screws haven't moved uh, when you need to. So that was a little bit of the issues that we discovered during the assembly. Uh, the stock went on just fine. The pistol grip went on just fine. Uh, the stock that they came with, as I explained, is the Luthar stock. And this was really the first T&E rifle that we've got in with this stock on it. I've shot the Luthar stock at various different demos. Uh, and my opinion of it at that time was it works just fine. Uh, it's a really nice lightweight option. The fit and finish on it is not uh, as great as some of the higher end stocks like the Magpul PRS, uh, but you're looking at a different price point and you're looking at a different weight as well. But with the Luthar stock, you still get a fully adjustable comb and a fully adjustable length of pull, uh, which is really something that I think is almost mandatory on chassis nowadays. The pistol grip that came with the chassis is AB Arms own P grip, and it is a really slender AR style grip. And it's I think it's really more suited to AR-15s uh, than it is to a precision rifle chassis because of how slender and how small that grip is. Uh, slender small grips work well for smaller people, children, if you have really small hands or really short fingers, uh, then they'll work fine. But if you have medium to large hands and standard size fingers, then you're going to have some issues uh, with this small pistol grip. And that was one thing that we noticed as soon as we got on the rifle and started dialing the ergonomics in. Let's talk about some of the ergonomic issues real fast. Uh, you'll notice right off the bat that the scope is sitting up pretty high. A lot of guys comment on that when they see this same setup on the KDX Strike 30 chassis. Well, that's true. The scope does sit pretty high over the bore, but that is not an issue with ballistics. It's not an issue with actually shooting the rifle. It can be an issue with ergonomics, with getting your cheek weld set up uh, if the chassis is not designed to accommodate that. So since we have this one piece 20 MOA canted rail on here, we really have to go with an AR height mounting system. And the spur improved scope mount system that we have on here is that kind of scope mount. Uh, it brings the scope up just high enough to clear the rail. And you see on the Bushnell XRS, we don't have a whole lot of extra room in here. So we really can't go with a lower mounting system. We could go with a smaller scope, uh, but this is a pretty standard scope for precision rifle competition. Now, in order to accommodate where this scope is at, we need to have a pretty high cheek weld. So the Luthar stock, the fact that it's adjustable is great. Uh, the problem is with the stock all the way up, we have run out of adjustment and I'm just barely getting a cheek weld. Uh, it's more like a mid cheek, almost chin weld uh, to get on the stock. I can't bury my face like I like to. Now I've got slightly high cheekbones to begin with. So my comb is usually up a little bit higher uh, than the next guys. In fact, some people have trouble shooting rifles that I've dialed in because they can't get their face low enough on the comb. Uh, so that is an issue with my particular bone structure and my particular ergonomics. But there really is no leeway on the Luthar stock here. You have to run the comb as high as you can run the comb uh, to get this to work. Now, one other issue that we found uh, with the stock, the way it's designed on the AB Arms chassis, is you see that we've got this really long piece of chassis sticking out here, uh, and then the stock starts after that. Well, what that gives us is an extremely long length of pull, even with the Luthar stock dialed all the way in. Now, the way I generally like to start with length of pull adjustments is I'll take my arm and I'll measure from the crook of my arm to my trigger finger where it's bent to fit on the trigger. So if we do that here, 
and I come over here, you'll notice that my trigger finger ends about in the middle of the pistol grip. Uh, that's really not a good thing with it dialed all the way in. Now on precision rifles, since we're not shooting them squared up and we're not always shooting them offhand, most of the time it's in a supported position, length of pull is not a make it or break it kind of thing. Uh, but if you try to put a small shooter on this rifle, uh, they're going to run into problems with that eye relief because you notice here, uh, we are all the way on the back edge of the rail with this scope. It's not a small scope. And if you take a small shooter and try to put them on this rifle, their face is going to be way back here. So again, we, we've run into a little bit of an ergonomic issue. Uh, this needs to be shortened up. The pistol grip really can be dropped down and the whole rear of the chassis system can be made a little bit more compact and that will resolve that issue. Now, let's come back to the pistol grip real quick here and talk about the pistol grip. Uh, the pistol grip again is designed for really small hands when put in this application. You see, if I take my medium to large size hands and wrap them around the grip, you can see where the trigger is and you can see where my finger ends up. To get the trigger, I have to bring my finger all the way back and curl it back on itself to interface with the front of the trigger. That puts my finger in this hook position and that's not good to get a straight rear push on the trigger. Uh, you can't get that 90 degree trigger finger and straight to the rear. Now I can make it work because what I basically end up doing is floating my whole firing hand and just anchoring the back of my hand to the grip with my thumb. That works for me because I know exactly what I'm trying to get out of my trigger pull. For less experienced shooters, that's gonna be a big problem and that can really dial in some nasty issues. When you have your finger hooked back that far, it's difficult to tell if you're pushing to one side or you're pulling to the other side or if you're getting your finger lined up straight on that trigger because you're not actually getting the middle of the pad of the finger, you're gonna end up on the tip of the finger. So again, not a good issue. Uh, that's not a good ergonomic fix. When we talked to AB Arms about that, uh, they recommended replacing this grip uh, with a duckbill type grip that pushes my hand back a little further. When we looked at the radius here on the back of the chassis and we thought, okay, that may work. I grabbed uh, Ergo Grip out of the drawer. Uh, this is one of the old Ergo Grips. It's not the tactical deluxe that we favor on most of our precision rifles. Uh, but it does have the duck bill, and I thought, okay, we're good to go. Well, we tried to mount the grip on the chassis, and we found that uh, the radius on the back of the chassis does not mimic the AR radius. Uh, it's just a little bit too short. The grip bottoms out on the flat here on the bottom of the chassis, and you can't screw it up into there. Uh, you end up with a big gap and you're just gonna have all kinds of problems with it. Now this is a hard plastic grip. It's not the rubber grip like the Ergo Tactical Deluxe is. On the Ergo Tactical Deluxe, there's a lot of flex in the duck bill. Uh, so one of those grips may work. It may allow you to crank it into the stock or into the chassis and get it to fit just fine. Uh, but it really, shouldn't be an issue. You, you shouldn't have to do that. Uh, just simply bringing the pistol grip back uh, resolves that issue and integrating a standard AR radius will make grips fit a whole lot better and give you a wider variety of grips that you can put in it. Now in addition, and here's the interesting engineering thing, if you bring that pistol grip back so you have a proper reach from your hand to your trigger, uh, then you also clear room to be able to access that action screw. So bringing the grip back actually fixes two problems at once. Now, if you like something like this Tango Down grip here that's got you know no kind of duck bill, uh, this grip will work and because of the extreme angle on the Tango Down grip, uh, it may actually work a little bit better. We just didn't get around to throwing the Tango Down grip on here because again, uh, the P-grip, I can make it work for the evaluation. Uh, but it's not something I would leave on there if I was keeping this as my personal rifle. 
Now coming forward, I do like the fact that the trigger guard, they made a nice large trigger guard so you're not going to have a problem getting in here with winter gloves on. And if you do shoot with big fat winter gloves on, that's one place that this skinny grip may actually help you a little bit uh, because you're not really going to be, you're not going to feel like you're holding a 2 by 4 uh, If you've got some big fat down gloves, then you'll actually still be able to get your finger in there and you'll be able to hold on to the pistol grip without issues. Now in the front of the pistol grip, we've got this little button here, and this is our mag release. And I thought that was a really interesting design for the mag release. Uh, you don't have any levers, anything outside the trigger guard to catch. Uh, it's really easy to get in there to push the button and to disengage the magazine. Now, some people may argue that it's not good to have any controls inside the trigger guard other than pressing the trigger. I'm kind of in the middle of the road on that. I don't like to stick my finger inside the trigger guard if I'm not actually in the process of indexing the trigger to pull the trigger. But on a bolt action rifle, I don't think it's that much of an issue. Uh, when you go to drop that magazine, more than likely your bolt's going to be to the rear, and I don't think it poses a safety issue, especially with as large as this trigger guard is. But it's something that you need to bear in mind. It's something that you need to train to make sure that your bolt's back before you go to drop that magazine. Uh, bolt action rifles tend to have much lighter triggers uh, than a lot of other rifles out there. So uh, reaching in to drop that magazine, if you've got a round in the chamber and the bolt closed, it may just take a brush on that trigger uh, to set it off. So again, something to bear in mind, but I thought it did show some thought in the design. They're not just putting the lever on the bottom uh, that everybody does nowadays. Uh, and it is ambidextrous. You can get it from either side, no matter uh, which hand you're shooting with. Now, the magazine that came with the Mod X chassis is an MDT magazine, Modular Driven Technologies. It is one of their polymer magazines. Uh, this one is 308. Now, a couple of things about the magazine real quick. And while this is an AICS compatible chassis, you can use any AICS compatible magazine in it. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about these real quick. Uh, the MDT magazines have a really, really short uh, cartridge overall length, so if you're shooting anything more than SAMI spec, uh, you're going to have problems getting cartridges in there. So if you like to load your bullets long, uh, this is not the magazine for you. Uh, the MDT magazines are they're billed and advertised as a 10-round magazine. If you put 10 rounds in here, that first round is very, very difficult to chamber. Uh, you really have to put a lot of effort into stripping it off. Uh, they should really be considered 9-round magazines because if you load 10 in here, uh, the magazine will swell just a little bit and it will not fit really well in a lot of chassis systems that are out there. Now, we did put, nine, or we did put 10 rounds in here to see how well it fit. Uh, in the Mod X chassis, and it will fit in the chassis just fine. Again, you just have issues uh, stripping that first round. Uh, so the MDT magazines, they work. They just have a couple of limitations that you have to bear in mind. One thing that I really do like about the magazine well design on the Mod X chassis is you have this really huge cutout here. So you can take this magazine and you can have the rifle totally down on the ground and still get a 10 round magazine locked in. Uh, the cutout also prevents some of the issues. If you do load 10 rounds in this magazine, uh, it'll still fit in. You won't have issues with the magazine jamming in there. Now one drawback to it when you use polymer magazines in a magwell like this is you have less protection for the magazine. So if the magazine takes a hard hit, uh, you're relying on the strength of the polymer to keep the magazine together instead of being supported by metal around it. So again, just something to bear in mind. Now, as we come forward, you'll notice we have this nice uh, little contoured section of the chassis here. Uh, for those of you guys that like to use that as a palm shelf uh, when you're shooting offhand, it's going to feel really nice. Uh, it's really well-rounded, really well-contoured. There is a drawback to that, especially when we look at the front here, this little nose. Uh, it's nicely rounded and nicely contoured, so if, when you go to slam this up against a barricade, uh, it's not going to sit really well unless you have a lot of downward pressure on the forend. Uh, if you get chewed up 2x4s at the top of the barricade, it will want to ride up over it uh, when you load the rifle against the barricade. So again, something to bear in mind. 
Uh, it's not a massive deal, but because that really is the only ledge that you have, you can't use this as a ledge, and the magazine may not be a wise idea to use as a stop. Uh, that, I'd like to see it squared off just a little bit more, or brought down just a little bit more to be able to be used as an improvised barricade stop. Now again, since you have key mod interfaced all along here, uh, you can go ahead and actually put a barricade stop or a hand stop somewhere up in here, uh, and it will work just fine for those purposes. I just like to see it built into the chassis. I always like to see a feature on the chassis uh, that I don't have to add something to that actually works really well. Now the fore end is nicely contoured. It's nicely rounded. Uh, it is all the edges on it, all the uh, tooling marks have been chamfered well, so you don't feel like you're holding a cheese grater up here. I always dislike uh, when manufacturers put a lot of details, a lot of cutouts, and then they don't come back and break the edges on it, uh, and it feels really ugly. It feels like you're going to cut your hand while you're holding it. I shouldn't have to wear a glove on my support hand uh, to hold a rail system that doesn't have rail covers or something on it. So, uh, the fact that they went through and they provided that detail is really nice. Uh, the anodizing on the chassis system looks really good. The fit and finish on the chassis is great. Uh, all the machining uh, looks really nice on it. Uh, they did put a lot of effort into actually making the chassis look good. Uh, like I said, the, the engineering side of things, just little ergonomic issues are what we found at fault in the chassis. Uh, overall, once we had all the uh, drawbacks marked down, uh, we were contacted by the company and uh, the president actually asked us uh, what we thought of the chassis system. Uh, and we told them and they were very, very quick to try to address those issues. Uh, the issue we have with the Mod 22 trigger, uh, they asked us to go ahead and send them pictures and measurements of the trigger in so that they could add that to their program and so that they can open up that inlet uh, to be able to fit a wide variety of triggers. Because to be honest, if you spent the money that this Mod 22 costs and you couldn't fit it in your brand new chassis system, you'd probably be a little irritated. Um, we also mentioned the recoil lug uh, issue. Uh, and they stated that's something they're going to look at addressing in the uh, Generation 3 chassis. Uh, they are also looking at using their own buttstock design that will address the length of pull and the comb height issues, uh, as well as some of the pistol grip issues. So uh, it looks like everything that we found at fault in this generation of the Mod X uh, they're looking at resolving in the Gen 3, and they've already asked us if we'd like to look at the Gen 3 when it's ready to ship, uh, and we definitely said yes. So our opinion right now of the AB Arms Mod X chassis is that if you're looking for this and you like the features in it, uh, you probably need to hang tight until the Gen 3 is released, uh, and then take a look at the Gen 3. Uh, overall, the Gen 2, I think, is a great effort uh, but it still has a bunch of places where it needs to be refined. Now, AB Arms is a veteran-owned company. Uh, the chassis system is made here in the U.S., so we really have an interest in seeing them succeed, and we're really happy that they reached out to us to ask us where they can improve the chassis system. Uh, that really shows us that they are trying to make the absolute best chassis system they possibly can. Uh, and the price point, I think when they get the ergonomic issues lined out, I think the price point is about right. I will be really interested to see their buttstock design uh, because that is a make it or break it point. Uh, how the adjustments work, uh, how quickly it is to be able to change it up for different shooters, uh, that is really an important thing when you're looking at a chassis system. Uh, for us, the ergonomics were really the point where we decided that this chassis system is not going to be at the top of our picks because when we put a chassis system on a rifle, the whole purpose is to be able to dial that rifle in to our body. Uh, we should never have to put a chassis system on a rifle and then have to change the way we shoot or the way we address the rifle in order to accommodate the chassis system. That's really not the way things should work. Uh, we should be able to fit the rifle perfectly to our individual body. And it's an added bonus if we can quickly refit that rifle to another shooter. So I'm really excited to look at the AB Arms Mod X Gen 3 chassis. 
Um, but my opinion on the Mod X that we have is wait until the Gen 3 is released. If you guys have any questions or comments about the AB Arms Mod X chassis, uh, please leave them in the comment section below. If you like this video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And until next time, get out and shoot!